um, I wanted to make a video about maybe the 10 most important books of my life as of now and I said to myself that I will make this video um, I will share with you whoever you are the 10 books which I don't know if they have been the more the most important or the most influential but if I had to define them I would say that these are the books that I have never fully read and that I have kept coming back to at several moments of my life and uh, this will this will become more intelligible um, in the second part of the video once I have shared the 10 books I will read um, the final chapter of how to read a book by Mortimer J. Adler and, and he talks about reading and the growth of the mind but the 10 books that I will share are books to which I I have kept coming back at various moments of my life uh, that I have never fully read or maybe I have briefly but these are the books that keep questioning me and yeah so I try to classify them in what I think is the chronological order in which I have encountered this book in my life but I'm not sure that's the chronological order so First, the Bible. Um, I guess that I studied the Bible when I was a teenager because I was in a religious school. And um, I have read briefly the New Testament in Latin with the ancient Greek translation, uh, not in a systematic and thorough way, but with the French translation and I have read many extracts of the Bible throughout my life so yeah then Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky this is a book that I bought probably in my early adult life when I was in my early 20s and I have started to read this book at least three, four times and I never read the whole book but uh, yeah <clears throat> then uh, this book 40 lessons to discover Latin I bought this book in 2016 before my intellectual awakening because uh, I asked myself for the first time the question what is worth passing on for the first time I had envisioned the passing on of generations uh, that I myself that's what I thought as an individual I would have to to leave room for the next generation and I thought what is worth preserving what is worth um, passing on and I thought about Latin I had never studied Latin that's why I wanted to discover and this book has offered me um, great intellectual satisfaction because the Latin language is a very logically structured language it uh, most of the the words of the French language um, are derived from Latin I think more than 80% so uh, it's relatively easy to read Latin for a French person and uh, I have kept coming back to this book over the years because yeah then there is this book how to read a book which is maybe the most important I don't know because it's it develops such a wealth of profound philosophical ideas in an intelligible way so that's 
I guess, the best introduction to philosophy I can think of because the, the ideas are clear, intelligible, structured, and uh, I said to myself yesterday when I planned on making this video that if there was a man for whom I felt uh, what we could call gratefulness or gratitude, it's Mortimer Adler because he was a very intelligent and profound man who I don't know him personally in his life, I just know about him this book. And he wrote this book to, to enable to make philosophical knowledge uh, accessible to a wide audience. And uh, a part of me feel grateful to this man for having produced this book. Then, of course, the phenomenology of spirit. I don't know if I bought the book when I was a Marxist before 2016, but I remember, I'm sure that I have tried to read the book uh, in, in early 2018, uh, after I had projected uh, the phenomenology of my own mind, namely all the intellectual steps that I had encountered and, and went through, gone through uh, over my intellectual development from August 2016 until January 2018. And when I made a, a summary, a checkup of all the steps that I had gone through, I said to myself, it looks like the phenomenology of my own mind. And I thought about Hegel's book and I probably bought the book if I hadn't already in my library, but I started to be interested in this book. And this is a book that I keep coming back to and reading and rereading, although I have not read entirely, but uh, yeah. Then <clears throat> in probably February, towards February 2018, there's this book, The Exegesis of Philip K. Dick. I've kept coming back to this book because it's full of intriguing ideas. I made videos, many videos about this book, so yeah. <sighs> then <clears throat> this book that I discovered probably early month of 2018, which has been one of the most influential books for my intellectual and spiritual developments, Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition. Yeah. Then <clears throat> this book, Kant's Lectures on Logic. Again, it's a book that I have kept coming back to because it enables me to understand classical non-Hegelian logic. And uh, every time that I have tried to read this book, and it's, it's rather intelligible, uh, it's because I said to myself, I am trying to understand Hegel's logic, but I cannot understand Hegel's logic without understanding classical logic, because Hegel's logic was an attempt to to transcend ordinary classical logic. But first, I have to understand ordinary classical logic. So I have read this book many times and yeah. Uh, and then I don't know in which order, probably this book, the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, um, in outline by Hegel, and finally, the Wissenschaft der Logik, the book that I keep uh, reading when I am lost. And since I am very often lost, I often come back to this book. So these are, as of now, the 10 books 
these are not my favorite books. These are not uh, the books that have maybe been the most influential and maybe they have been, but these are the books that I have come back to the most often in my life without fully reading these books, fully understanding these books. Uh, maybe that's how I could define them as of now. These are the, the 10 books. They, they, ha they all share this, this fundamental characteristic that I have tried to read them several times without reading them fully, without understand understanding them fully and at different periods of my, of my life. These are the fundamental characteristics. So these are the 10 books as of now that have been the most influential. And now um, the second part of the video, I will read uh, extracts and quotes from <clears throat> the chapter 21, which is the final chapter of how to read a book. It's titled Reading and the Growth of the Mind. It says, activity is the essence of good reading and the more active reading is, the better it is. So the idea is that when you read a book, you have to put in a lot of intellectual effort. It's not just passive reading, it's a conceptual effort. Uh, we have identified and discussed the four levels of reading. There is reading, which means just to be able to decipher the words, reading for, for kids. Then there is um, inspectional reading, which is what he calls skimming, analyzing the structure of the book, the main ideas without reading fully. Then the third level is analytical reading. It's a thorough, in-depth, complete reading of a book, which requires a lot of time and effort. You have to analyze every word, every sentence. You have to take notes, commentaries, thinking things through, questioning the book. And finally, the fourth level of reading is syntopical reading. It's when you read several books in an analytical way, but several books which revolve around the same topic and you read them through one another and you try to organize a, a discussion between the authors of the various books to try to, 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 to understand the topic that you are discussing. So these are the four levels that he talks about throughout the book. Um, then what good books can do for us? Um, if you are reading in order to become a better reader, you cannot read just any book or article. You will not improve as a reader if all you read are books that are well within your capacity. You must tackle books that are beyond you, or as we have said, books that are over your head. So in his view, reading is a challenge and there are various levels of difficulty in reading books. And the more challenging books, the more cognitively and intellectually demanding books are those that one should focus one's mind upon, according to him. We are not against amusement, the idea of reading for enjoyment or fun, but improvement in reading skills does not accompany um, it. Um, a book that merely informs you of facts without adding to your understanding of those facts uh, will not necessarily increase your, your, your faculty of understanding. It can help to accumulate facts and data and statistics, but it's not enough in his view. Reading for information does not stretch your mind any more than reading for amusement. There is reading for information, knowledge, statistics, data, quantitative numbers. Reading for amusement, for enjoyment, distraction, and reading for understanding. And he distinguishes these three aspects. They are not necessarily excluding one another, but um, reading for understanding can and should maybe be independent of the other two um, modes. 
the good reader makes demands on himself when he reads. Um, the books that you will want to practice your reading on must also make demands on you. They must seem to you to be beyond your capacity. So a, a, a book, in his view, has to be challenging. It has to challenge your mind. There are certainly some books that will continue to extend you no matter how good a reader you are. Such books, those who make a constant demand upon the reader, uh, they are the ones that provide a constant and never-ending challenge to their skill. The great scientific books are in many ways easier to read than non-scientific ones because of the care with which scientific authors help you to come to terms, identify the key propositions, and state the main arguments. It's true that scientific books like physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology seem to be very difficult, but and, and they are, but in a sense, the author always help you to understand because every term, every word, every definition is, is defined precisely. So if you have enough focus and attention, uh, you can understand these books, most of them. Um, Homer is in, way, in many ways harder to read than Newton because Hom Homer deals with subjects that are harder to write well about. A good book does reward you for trying to read it. The best books reward you most of all. Um, there is the improvement in your reading skill that occurs when you successfully tackle a good, difficult work. A good book can teach you about the world and about yourself. You also learn more about life. You are more deeply aware of the great and enduring truths of human life. There are some human problems, after all, that have no solution. The greatest books can help you to think better about these problems because they were written by men and women who thought better than other people about them. And he talks about the pyramid of books the quantitative classification of books. The great majority of the several million books that have been written in the Western tradition alone, more than 99% of them, will not make sufficient demands on you for you to improve your skill in reading. These are the books that can be read only for amusement or information. You do not have to read them analytically at all. Skimming will do, so to inspect the content of the book, the summary, table of contents, introduction, conclusion, a few key ideas here and there, that's enough for more than 99% of books in his view. There is a second class of books from which you can learn both how to read and how to live. Less than one out of every hundred books belong to this class. Probably it is more like one in a thousand or even one in 10,000. These are the good books, the ones that were carefully wrote by Rot, W-R-O-U-G-H-T, wrote, not written, write, wrote, written, but wrote. I don't know what this word means, but I guess I get the meaning. Uh, carefully wrote by their authors, the ones that convey to the reader significant insights about subjects of enduring interest to human beings. There are in all probably no more than a few thousand such books. They make severe demand on the reader. They are worth reading analytically once. So analytical reading is thorough reading. You read every passage, you analyze, you structure, you comment, you think, you meditate, you, 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 you try to, to interpret the, the structure of the book, the ideas that the, the author wanted to share, maybe the historical context which brought for the book. So that's thorough, demanding uh, reading, analytical reading. It takes a lot of time and effort. Um, 
such books, so the ones who deserve thorough analytical reading, such books stretch your mind and increase your understanding. But as your mind stretches and your understanding increases, you realize, by a process that is more or less mysterious, that you are not going to be changed anymore in the future by this book. You realize that you have grasped the book in its entirety. You have milked it dry. You are grateful for it, for what it has given you, but you know it has no more to give. So these kind of books, uh, one in a hundred, one in, in, in a thousand, one in ten thousand, they demand and require careful, thorough, um, dedicated analytical reading. But once you have done the analytical reading, you have extracted everything from the book and, and you, don't, you, don't knew, you, you don't need the book anymore, maybe to refresh your memory, but you have gotten everything you could from the book. Then he, he talks about a, a different um, class of books. Of the few thousand such books that he's just mentioned, there is a much smaller number, here the number is probably less than a hundred, that cannot be exhausted by even the very best reading you can manage. So here he's talking about a very limited amount of books, less than a hundred books, in the Western tradition, but in the world at large, I guess. How do you recognize this? Again, it is rather mysterious. But when you have closed the book after reading it, reading it analytically to the best of your ability and place it back on the shelf, you have a sneaking suspicion that there is more there than you got. If the book belongs to the second class of books to which we referred before, the ones that are worth reading analytically, but the ones from which you can extract all the meaning once you've read it analytically once. So to this second class of books to which we referred before, you find on returning to it that there was less there than you remembered. The reason, of course, is that you yourself have grown in the meantime. Your mind is fuller, your understanding greater. The book has not changed, but you have such a return is inevitably disappointing because the, the book has remained the same but you have grown intellectually and spiritually in between so it is less impressive than what you thought it was when you first discovered the book because you have grown but if the book belongs to the highest class the the, the 100 or the less maybe than 100 the very small number of inexhaustible books, you discover on returning that the book seems to have grown with you. You see new things in it, whole set of new things that you did not see before. How can a book grow as you grow? It is impossible, of course. A book, once it is written and published, does not change. But what you only now begin to realize is that the book was so far above you to begin with that it has remained above you and probably always will remain so. The book truly lifted you then, but now, even though you have become wiser and more knowledgeable, it can lift you again and it will go on doing this until you die. There are obviously not many books that can do this for any of us. Our estimate was that the number is considerably less than a hundred. And he says, you should seek out the few books that can have this value for you. The books that will teach you the most. They are the books to which you will want to return over and over. They are the books that will help you grow. Then the final part. Uh, is titled The Life and Growth of the Mind. There is an old test. It was quite popular a generation ago. I don't know when it was written. I think the book was written in officially in, in the 1940s, but it was published again in the 1970s, and I have the edition of the 1970s, so I don't know what generation he's referring to, but anyway, it's not important. There is an old test that was designed to tell you which books are the ones that can do this for you. Suppose the test went, 
that you know in advance that you will be marooned on a desert island for the rest of your life, or at least for a long period. Suppose, too, that you have time to prepare for the experience. There are certain practical and useful articles that you would be sure to take with you. You will also be allowed 10 books. Which ones would you select? My life experience as of now has developed and unfolded in such a way that the 10 books that I have unconsciously selected, I guess, have the, are the 10 books that I have listed. But if I had to choose 10 books, I would not choose these 10 books. Um, I would probably take at least one blank, empty book and a paper to write my own, my own history. I would take such a book with me. We are all to some extent persons marooned on a desert island. We all face the same challenge that we would face if we really were there. The challenge of finding the resources within ourselves to live a good human life. There is a strange fact about the human mind, a fact that differentiates the mind sharply from the body. The body is limited in ways that the mind is not. One sign of this is that the body does not continue indefinitely to grow in strength and develop in skill and grace. By the time most people are 30 years old, their bodies are as good as they will ever be. In fact, many persons' bodies have begun to deteriorate by that time. But there is no limit to the amount of growth and development that the mind can sustain. The mind does not stop growing at any particular age, only when the brain itself loses its vigor in senescence does the mind lose its power to increase in skill and understanding. If we lack resources within ourselves, we cease to grow intellectually, morally and spiritually. And when we cease to grow, we begin to die. Yeah, that's what I had to share. <laughs>